Hello everybody, my name is Luke Mar, and this is Hot La Mode, and today on Hot La Mode, yes, I know I look like I'm in a weird place, but I'm actually starting my vacation, and I know I've been gone from YouTube for a little bit, I've been really bad at posting videos, but I'm doing my best to get back on it. So there are going to be a couple of MacBook videos, just because I don't really have the ability to put out really amazing video quality ones, not that I put out amazing video quality videos, though. But today we are talking about Lucinda Chambers, and she was the fashion director of British Vogue under Alexander Shulman. She was at British Vogue for 36 years, I believe, but we'll get into that during the actual interview that she gave. But this kind of interview that she gave, um, she, it caused a lot of drama in the fashion publishing industry. She kind of calls out British Vogue, she calls out Edward Enenful, who is the new editor-in-chief. There's just a lot going on, and so I thought I would read it to you guys and react and discuss everything that's going on, because it is really important to talk about the transparency that is not present in the fashion industry, and especially in the fashion publishing industry. So, let's just get right into it. I'm reading this from the Front Row Edit, which is an amazing little blog website that talks about all about fashion. So, let's get into it. A month and a half ago, I was fired from Vogue. It took them three minutes to do it. No one in the building knew what was going to happen. The management and the editor I worked for for 25 years had no idea, nor did HR. Even the chairman told me he did not know it was going to happen. No one knew except the man who did it, the new editor. Afterwards, I walked out and ran into the publisher. Oh, Lucinda, how are you? I told him I had just been fired. He said, outrageous, ridiculous, crazy. I phoned my lawyer. She asked me what I wanted to do about it. I told her I wanted to write a letter to my colleagues to tell them that Edward Enenful decided to let me go, and to say how proud I am to have worked at Vogue for as long as I did, to thank them for being such brilliant colleagues. My lawyer said, sure, but don't tell HR. They wouldn't have wanted me to send it. So here's the thing. Edward Enenful, in reality, is a very revolutionary editor. He is the first black gay male to be a editor-in-chief of a Vogue, which is really big, um, not only being black, not only being a man, also not only being gay, all three of those things together are very powerful. Edward also does revolutionary styling. He really, I think, wants to push British Vogue from being the stuffy British publication that it was. And if anybody wants to say that British Vogue was not stuffy and boring and sad, you are smoking something and I want you to give me some of that. I have no problem letting Edward, who has brought in the all black issues of Vogue Italia, um, who has really done some of the most amazing styling work for a Condé Nast publication, to go in and say, I'm sorry, I really don't want you here anymore. I just don't think you're going to fit with what I want for the brand. And so you know what? I understand that and I respect that. Next paragraph. Later, I was having lunch with an old friend who had just been fired from Sotheby's. She said to me, Lucinda, will you please stop telling people that you've been fired? I asked her why. It's nothing I'm ashamed of. She told me, if you keep talking about it, then that becomes a story. The story should be that you've had the most incredible career for over 30 years. The story shouldn't be that you've been fired. Don't muck up the story. But I don't want to be that person. I want, I don't want to be the person who puts on a brave face and tells everyone, oh, I decided to leave the company. When everybody knows you've really been fired. There's too much smoke and mirrors in the industry as it is. And anyway, I didn't leave. I was fired. And this also I respect. There is so much fakeness going on in the fashion industry from the top down. And good for Lucinda that she's saying, I want everybody to know I was fired. And that's okay that I was fired. And so I think that's really great. Fashion can chew you up and spit you out. I worked with a brilliant designer when I was at Marnie. Paolo Mellon Anderson. I adored him. He was challenging but highly intelligent. Fragile like a lot of creative people. We had our ups and downs but he stayed with us for seven years. Then Chloe came along. The CEO at the time asked my advice about Paolo and I told him, Paolo is great but you have to know he won't turn the brand around for you in a season or even two. You got to give him time and surround him by the right people. Absolutely, absolutely, he said. I'll do that. Three seasons later, Paolo was out. They didn't give him time, and he never got his people. I felt so sad for Paolo. If you want good results, you have to support people. You don't get the best out of anyone by making them feel insecure and nervous. Ultimately, the way of treating people is only about control. If you make someone feel nervous, you've got them. But in my view, you've got them in the wrong way. You've got them in a state of anxiety. I'm thinking of one fashion editor in particular. It's his modus operandi. 
He will wrong foot you and wrong foot you and have everybody going shit, 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 shit. Believe that the editor that she must be talking about is Edward. Um, I don't know much about Edward's task giving at his last magazine, W. I also don't really know the insider scoop on how Edward works. But I do know that I respect what she's saying about you need to give people time. But at the same time, I don't know if she was going to be right for Edward's vision. And so you can't, you know, if he doesn't, if he had somebody already in mind that he wanted, you can't be really that upset about it. But it's true what she's saying about giving designers time to put themselves and make the brand themselves. That's a different story. You have to kind of give people time to put themselves and the brand's heritage together and let them mix and let them melt together and then you'll have an amazing product but with the editor thing it's kind of different you're not allowed to fail in fashion especially in this age of social media when everything is about leading a successful amazing life nobody today is allowed to fail instead the prospect causes anxiety and terror but why can't we celebrate failure after all it helped us grow and develop i'm not ashamed of what happened to me if my shoes were really crappy dot 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 oh i know they weren't all good some were crappy the June cover with a Luxa Chung and a stupid Michael Kors t-shirt is crap. He's a big advertiser, so I knew why I had to do it. I knew it was cheesy when I was doing it, and I did it anyway. Okay, whatever. But there were others. There were others that were really great. That I agree with. Um, Lucinda calls out the fact that advertisers really have control over the magazines. And a lot of the time, and I have personal experience in this, getting the advertisers clothing that are advertising in the magazine is the most important job. It literally is the thing that gives stylists and fashion editors the most anxiety. How are they going to style pieces that, let's be real, are not amazing or don't always work with the story? And it's hard and it really makes it hard for them to do their job creatively and freely. I also understand that obviously the magazine needs to make money, but there has to be some sort of way to be integral about it. In fashion, people take you on your own estimation of yourself. That's just a given. You can walk into a room feeling pumped up and confident, and if you radiate that, the industry will believe in what you project. If, on the other hand, you appear vulnerable, you won't be seen as a winner. I remember a long time ago when I was on maternity leave, Vogue employed a new fashion editor. When I met with my editor after having had my baby, she told me about it. She said, Oh, Lucinda, I've employed someone and she looks fantastic. She was wearing a red velvet dress and a pair of Wellington boots to the interview. This was 20 years ago. She went on, she's never done a shoot before, but she's absolutely beautiful and so confident. I just fell in love with the way she looked. And I went, okay, okay, let's give her a go. She was a terrible stylist, just terrible. But in fashion, you can go far if you look fantastic and confident. No one wants to be the one to say, but they're crap. Honestly, Anya, you can go quite far with just that. Fashion is full of anxious people. No one wants to be the one missing out. This I agree with. I think a lot of people are taken on how they look, and that is what the industry in reality is based on. How you look, and how your body looks, and what you're wearing, and who you are, and what your name is. It happens all the time. All of the girls that are models' daughters, or Kendall Jenner, those girls, that is, they are the epitome of what Lucinda is talking about here. Fashion moves like a shoal of fish. It's cyclical and reactionary. Nobody can stay relevant for a lifetime. You always have peaks and troughs. The problem is that people are greedy. They think, it worked then, we've got to make it work now. But fashion is an alchemy. It's the right person at the right company at the right time. Creativity is a really hard thing to quantify and harness. The rise of high street has put new expectations on big companies like LVMH. Businessmen are trying to get their creatives to behave in a more business-like way. Everybody wants more and more, faster and faster. Big companies demand so much more from their designers. We've seen the casualties. It's really hard. Those designers are going to have drinking problems. They're going to have drug problems. They're going to have nervous breakdowns. It's too much to ask a designer to do 8 or in some cases 16 collections a year. The designers do it, but they do it badly. And then they're out. They fail in a very public way. How do you then get the confidence to say, I will go back in and do it again? This happens all the time. Look at every fucking Chanel and Fendi collection that we've seen. Karl Lagerfeld is doing his own line, Fendi and Chanel. This is just him as an example. Those collections are shit. They are absolute shit. They're terrible. Because nobody, there's no direction. Nobody's actually thinking about what they're putting out on the runway. 
it's just how it is. Raph Simmons left Dior because he could not do all of the collections. And that's why he's only doing a couple collections of Calvin Klein. But at Dior, he was doing eight or ten because he had his own line. It's too much for people. Alexander McQueen, John Galliano, all were at the height of everything when they were doing their brands. As soon as the drug and drink hit, they collapsed. Their careers were over. One of them's dead. It's too much to expect of normal human beings. The most authentic company I ever worked for is Marnie. We didn't advertise and what we showed on the catwalk we always produced. We never wanted to be in fashion. If you bought a skirt 20 years ago, you can still wear it today. We never changed the goalposts. Our shows were about empowering women. We always treated our models beautifully and had incredible diversity in the company. My team was half boys, half girls, all different nationalities. It was very transparent. But when the company was sold, everything changed. The Castiglionis were naive. They sold 60% of the company thinking that the new owner would respect what they had built. I never understood why they sold it to Renzo Rosso, of all people. He is the antithesis of everything Marnie stood for. The antithesis. When Consuelo left, I remember thinking, why not give the design task to someone from the team? It would have been a reflection of how fashion is created today. And it worked for Gucci. Alessandro Michele had been at the brand forever before becoming the creative director. I talked to Renzo and he agreed, but then at the last minute he changed his mind. He brought Francesco Rizzo on board, who had nothing to do with the company. Before Marnie, he did celebrity dressing at Prada. He'd never done a show, he'd never run a team. But he knows Anna Wintour. And who is Renzo Rosso enthralled by? Anna Wintour. The last women's wear collection at Marnie was a disaster and had terrible reviews. The show was appalling. I heard the cost to produce it was two and a half times what we used to spend, and it sold 50% less. A lot of American buyers didn't even bother to turn up. Marnie is no more. It saddens me, but then I remind myself that from the ashes, something new can emerge. This is true. I think if you think about Gucci, there was a moment where they brought in, um, I don't even remember her name, but they brought her in. She had nothing to do with the company. And the collections were terrible. They were so horrible. Nobody wanted Gucci anymore. And as soon as Alessandro came, he knew the DNA of the company. He'd worked there for years. He was doing behind the scenes stuff. He got his creative vision and it blew up and it was amazing. And Gucci is the moneymaker of caring. And so it's just interesting. And she's right that you need to respect the brands. They are not going to be top man. You can't produce a shit ton of collection. You can't just bow down to Anna Wintour because she has some advertising power. When Vetmont came on the scene, what they were doing felt new. At that particular time, it wasn't what anybody else was doing. And when I saw the last Balenciaga show, okay, you can say it's a bit more jello or a bit this or that, but honestly, I was really, really, really excited. You know what was smart about it? It was the scale. You saw this tiny model emerge and it took forever for her to get close to the audience. It built up expectation. Everything was thought through. The casting, the music, the space, everything. And I loved how we were all seated, so far from each other. It all felt anonymous. Normally at a fashion show, everyone looks at each other. Who wears what? Who sits where? Oh, she's got the new Celine shoes. But here you felt as if you were on your own. It was a new feeling. That is why I love Balenciaga. Yes, he is very Margiela in what he does. But at the same time, nobody else is doing that. He actually cares about the clothing. Fashion shows are all about expectation and anxiety. We're all on display. It's theater. I'm 57 and I know that when the shows come around in September, I will feel vulnerable. Will I still get a ticket? Where will I sit? I haven't had to think about those things for 25 years. Most people who leave Vogue end up feeling that they're lesser than. And the fact is that you're never bigger than the company you work for. But I have a new idea now. And if it comes off, maybe I won't be feeling so vulnerable after all. We'll have to wait and see. There are very few fashion magazines that will make you feel empowered. Most leave you totally anxiety ridden for not having the right kind of dinner party, setting the table in the right way, or meeting the right kind of people. Truth be told, I haven't read Vogue in years. Maybe I was too close to it after working there for so long, but I never felt like I led a vogue kind of life. The clothes are just irrelevant for most people, so ridiculously expensive. What magazines want today is the latest, the exclusive. It's a shame that magazines have lost the authority they once had. They've stopped being useful. In fashion, we are always trying to make people buy something they don't need. We don't need any more bags, shirts, or shoes, so we cajole, bully, or encourage people into continue buying. I know glossy magazines are meant to be aspirational, but why not both useful and aspirational? That's the kind of fashion magazine I'd like to see.
Lucinda Chambers served as fashion director of British Vogue for 25 years. The interview by Anya Arnowski Kronberg was deleted from Best Joel's website. Anya is editor in chief and founder of the online site Best Joel. Both are unavailable to comment on the interview. It's very interesting what she's saying here, and I respect it. It's good to call out the industry because it needs to be called out. We are no longer living in the world where Devil Wears Prada is the it thing. Fashion does not move at the pace of a magazine anymore. Nobody reads magazines anymore, and magazines will go dead. Sorry, I hate to I hate to be the, the bad guy. People that buy magazines, fashion magazines, are people that are in the fashion industry. They are the only people that respect them, the only people that care. So in order to be new and interesting in fashion, you have to be democratic. You can't just put all white girls, you can't appropriate a culture, you're, just, you know, you have to be respectful of where we are in the world, and magazines are not, and it's true. I hope that with Edward, we kind of push the magazine industry forward, but personally, I don't see that happening. But please let me know what you guys thought about this whole interview and my thoughts on it. I love to see what you guys read and write and say always. I find you guys very interesting and lovely and amazing and intelligent. So thank you guys for watching. I will be putting out more stuff. I promise, I promise, I promise. Again, thank you guys and TTYL.